prominent guy, and he doesn't like to really uh, get high, especially because it affects his vocal cords, and he's very sensitive to that. And they asked him about retirement. He says, I would consider it, but I'm having too good of a time. I think that I'm as good as I've ever been, and if I went on stage and I didn't have it, then I would probably stop. He says, but you know what? I think y'all let me know, meaning like everybody would let him know, like in terms of the fans, like he would catch the vibe that that was that it was time for him to retire. So he was pretty forward about that. And Eddie, of course, you know, he loves to praise Sam because that's his buddy. And he talks about it every five minutes about how he loves Sam and that that's his buddy and blah, blah, blah. He says there, he goes, oh, he goes, you know what, Sam? He says, you're a complete freak of nature, he called him. You know, he says, you're a freak of nature. Then he went to Michael and he said, what's going on with Van Halen, right? So Michael says, there's nothing going on at this point. And Sammy says, listen, if that show happens with Mike and Van Halen, I'd go see it. And Mike goes, I'd get you backstage. <laughs> but Sammy says, there's no show. Don't worry about it. And he, <laughs> So Eddie says, you know what? Let's everybody go outside and march up the street to Eddie's house. <laughs> So this was interesting. So Eddie, I'll give Eddie credit here. He he really uh, pulled this out. Listen, in Noel Monk's book, and he brought Noel Monk up. So we could, you know, for Noel, he got a little uh, promotion there, Mr. Noel Monk. He said that Ted Templeman said that he was unhappy with Dave's vocals and suggested Sammy Hagar as a replacement singer. And Michael Anthony confirmed that. He says that is totally true. And Sammy said, well, Ted told me that after the fact. He says it would have worked, but the way it went down was so much better. He says the band had two lives. It was better that the band had its legacy than I came in, and against all odds, it worked out. He says we might have broke up after a few years, and we would have never had the band again. He goes, we wouldn't have had 5150 or OU812 it went to, or the Four Unlawful Carnal Knowledge album. And he goes, those are great records. We probably wouldn't have gotten that far. And then Michael said, we told Ted... Make us sound big and bad like Montrose. That's what Van Halen told him while they were making Van Halen 1. Sammy said that those first Van Halen records, from the first one to 1984, were great records. So he's giving credit to that era of Van Halen. He says, I take nothing away from that. And I couldn't have walked into a band like that and had the success we had without that. So I give him credit for saying that. Then he made a, uh, he's like the Joe Biden of rock and roll. He goes, and then I turned the band into a stadium act who could play anywhere in the world. And I was like, <laughs> now, come on, Sam, you're on a good roll there. So they he were says, already a stadium act. <laughs> I know. Can you imagine? And then he said, it's like Dave did all the dirty work and I came in and said, hey. <laughs> so I do say, yeah, that is kind of the way it was. A little bit, a little bit. I mean, they, they rode the wave of 1984, but Sam definitely delivered as well. He couldn't be crap. Uh, he definitely delivered. So Eddie brought up David Lee Roth. He goes, he said, last year you told me you wanted to hire Roth for your high tide beach party. And I want to know if you're going to ask him again. And he said, yeah, yeah. I said, I, I think he was close to doing it, but I'll ask him again. He goes, I think he's waiting on a Van Halen tour. But he did say that uh, Extreme is going to be on the bill this year. And Mike got all excited and said, yeah, I want to jam with my buddy Gary. And, and so maybe there might be some Van Halen 3 songs played at the High Tide Beach Party, which we will get to uh, in the next segment here. And he also said that Richie Sambora is going to join them this year and that they're going to play Wanted Dead or Alive and Rock Candy and Rock and Roll by um, Led Zeppelin and stuff like that. He said he likes to call all his friends. Then he also made a little comment toward the end of, of the interview, which was sort of a surprise. He said that there is a film made by ZZ Satriani, which is Joe Satriani's son, who shot an entire film based on Sammy's album, and that there's clips for each song, and that there's action and animation and live actors and all kinds of stuff. So that's interesting. I don't know how he's going to release that or what's going to happen with that. But, wow. Uh, yeah, isn't that that's, wild? Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So that would, I hope that comes out. That would really be, I mean, you got to give him credit. That guy is promoting this album. Oh, yeah. Like any and every way Absolutely. he can. Absolutely. And like I promised, he did announce his High Tide Beach show. So let me uh, mention that here real quick. Sammy Hagar's High Tide Beach Party is going to be taking place 
Saturday and Sunday of September 28th and 29th in Huntington Beach, California. And it's going to be a monstrous bill this year. Holy cow. So in addition to Sammy and the Circle, the Beach Boys are coming. They're going to have Vince Neil of Motley Crue, Night Ranger, Blue Oyster Cult, Extreme, Steel Panther, Tony Lewis from the Outfield, Patty Smythe and Scandal, our buddy Eddie Trunk is going to be there. David, if you can believe it or not, but Tom Wopat of the Dukes of Hazard is going to be there. Just a good old boy. Just a good old boy. Never meaning no harm. no harm. I'm <laughs> system like two modern day Robin Day Robin Hood. <laughs> It's going to be a huge two-day party, and it's going to be very exciting. So that's going to be happening on the so, September 28th and 29th, Sammy's High Tide Beach Party and Car Show. And you can get tickets at HighTideBeachParty.com because they are currently available. Sammy went on the Jenny McCarthy show on Sirius XM. Jenny McCarthy, who is the comedian and also wife of Donnie Wahlberg. Donnie Wahlberg. That's his wife. So Sammy went on there. Why are you talking like that? Because Donnie's <laughs> from Boston. That's that my was bo- a Boston accent? Donnie Wahlberg. Wow. That's wow, how they no. talk in Boston. Yeah. Yeah. Aren't um, you near Boston? Oh boy, keep going. Just get keep going. mate. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I am. Well, throw some shrimp on the barbie. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I was just like, I didn't know. <laughs> I didn't know one of them was Australian. I just didn't know where that was going. I War- forgot she was married to Donnie Wahlberg, actually. Wahlberg, Australian <laughs> for beer. <laughs> Oh, don't forget, you're the international ambassador. The yeah, ambassador. well, you're, you're, you're helping us out a lot <laughs> with all your improvisation. Thank I'm you. I'm out of Thank my you fucking much. mind. <laughs> <laughs> I'm out of my mind. Um, bozy, bozy, bop. Zitty bop. <laughs> oh, my God, that's the best. So he's on the Jenny McCarthy show, and he says, when you love what you do, you are retired. Meaning, like, he feels like he's retired because he loves every day and this and that. And then he says, she says, well, who are your heroes? Who do you look up to? And he said, Clapton and Keith Richards. He says, I'd be their roadies if they let me. She said, what is one of the greatest compliments you ever received? You know, that was surprising to you, like a surprise. And he said he got a really nice compliment from James Taylor, that they were playing on the same bill on some charity event. And James Taylor said, oh, man, I wanted to jump up and join you on stage. (laughs) Which I thought was hysterical. I can't imagine James Taylor and Sammy Hagar together. That would be kind of funny. And one of the interesting takes of this whole thing, of the Jenny McCarthy show, was she said, what was going on in the 90s where it was Van Halen feeling nervous about the whole grunge movement? And he said, well, he goes, to be honest with you, he goes, these grunge guys were real down and dirty, and it made me nervous that they were going to disrespect us. He says, but this is what I did. I invited Alice in Chains to open up for us on tour. This way their fans would think we were cool. He says it worked. And he said, not only did it work, he says, but he has a lifelong friendship with Jerry Cantrell, who's the guitarist from Alice in Chains. So that's kind of cool. And that was on the Jenny McCarthy show. And then he also mentioned that he got into the theme of the album. So we talked about the album, his theme is greed and enlightenment, this and that. But he actually revealed the storyline now, Dave. Now, this is interesting because uh, the storyline here, he says, this album is about money, greed, enlightenment, and truth. It's a story of a guy who got rich and powerful, then all of a sudden puffed up and then goes to Vegas and gets involved with drugs and hookers and gambling. He gets wiped out and has an epiphany and decides that he's getting out of the game and moving out of the country and becoming a free man. But now he doesn't want to pay his taxes and he wants everybody off his land. And his wife leaves him, takes the money, and ends up crashing at his friend's house. And he watches his kids become trust fund babies, doing uh, blow and partying. And then he has an epiphany through affirmation and realizes money is not the root of all evil. And then he says that it's greed that is the real problem, that it's not just money, that it's the greed which is the issue. And he says that he's on a mission. That he wants to make sure that people, like the average folk, don't hate rich people. Like, there's no reason to hate rich people because these people who are frustrated with their lives, he says sometimes they hate the rich. But you shouldn't, guys like Warren Buffett and 
Bill Gates, he says, there's no reason to hate those guys. He goes, they're good people who do good things. And, and he talked about the good things that they do, about building hospitals and schools and all kinds of stuff like that. And, and he says, they're good people. You shouldn't hate rich people. They do good things. So, so Sam is just trying to get everybody off his back. Yeah, well, maybe, uh, you to. know, when you're, I don't know. I mean, I don't have that kind of money, that's for sure. But imagine if you had that level of money. I don't know. Maybe he feels like he's got more money than Michael Anthony, Eddie Van Halen, Alex Van Halen, Gary Sharon, and David Lee Roth put together. And maybe he feels like, mm, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> you know, maybe he feels like a little, maybe he feels like a little, uh, I don't know. Maybe he feels like a little uh, uneasy, you know? Maybe, maybe. Yeah. So who knows? But that was him on the Jenny McCarthy program. We have recorded our discussion of the Sammy Hagar album, and we always do the news last because we want to get the most news in. What do you make of this whole situation with that whole storyline? I, I don't think it was all that clear in the lyrics, right? That the storyline was... That's no, bad. when he puts it that way, yeah, yeah. it makes sense. But I, I certainly didn't get that right. storyline from the album. No, I didn't. You know, I didn't. Like we'll, like we'll get to later, it was less conceptual and more thematic. Right, 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 absolutely. So, I mean, the way he describes it, it's like, oh, yeah, okay, right. now I see what you're talking about. I know, I know. And then he went on one other show, which was the Paul Schaefer Plus One Sirius XM show, and wow, was, was this a wild one, because Paul Schaefer's a nut. So, and I love Paul Schaefer, I think he's great, but he's, he's crazy. So, he says that one thing that people have a misconception about with him and he says this happened in Van Halen and it happened in Montrose because he got fired from both bands. He says, I get excited and I get motivated and people think I'm trying to take over and they get insecure and then they come down on him. He might have a point there because Ronnie Montrose was a prickly character like Ed. That's true. You know? So That's who knows? true. Who knows? But there, I don't know. There were lots of other factors that went into the... Uh... The downfall of Van Halen. That's true. So. That's true. But he so did. we could go off on that for hours. We could. But, um, we could. but okay. that that's that's an interesting perspective. Yeah, it is, right? Isn't it? Anyway, so he gets into this and he talks about how him and Ed used to write because Paul is a musical guy. So he said Ed would have a bunch of parts to his song, and I would have to construct the song with the parts he gave me. He says that 5150, the song, he says if you heard it instrumentally, he says it's like a masterpiece because they, they carve the song out of th this music that Ed made. But he says it was like an instrumental masterpiece and that it was really something else. Now, the other thing is he said that Ed and Al would jam on riffs for hours. And, right. And that Sam would just kind of come up with something and kind of jump in to the mix there. And that's how they would do stuff. He also said the only song that he really brought to them was Finish What You Started. And he says it was inspired by the Who's Magic Bus on that song. That was the ins main inspiration behind Finish What You Started was the Who's Magic Bus. And he said basically what I had was this swampy riff. And he was playing kind of this version of uh, Finish What You Started without the kind of real twangy guitar riff that Ed does. You know, he, he just kind of had the basic chords. But he called Eddie one of the cleverest guys he's ever met. And he says the funny thing is about Ed is people don't realize how funky he is, that he has a real funky way about him. The other thing he said was that everything Ed does gets filtered through Ed. So in the sense that he says, if you say, Ed, play a Clapton riff, Ed would play it, but he would sound like Ed and not Clapton because Ed has a certain filter about him that just makes everything sound like Ed. You know what I mean? Gotcha. Yeah. And he also said that at the time, Eddie was really over playing guitar riffs, that he was sort of burnt out, and that he had these all these piano licks on tape that he had been saving for years and years, and that he and Al would go through the stuff and find all these different licks and said, oh, well, maybe Sammy could sing them, Dreams and When It's Love and, and Why Can't This Be Love. He says, everybody accused me of bringing that to Van Halen. He goes, I didn't bring that shit. I brought a voice and melodies. I didn't tell Ed to play keyboards in the band, and he was very deep into that stuff. He said, like, he was held back all those years with Roth with the keyboard stuff, and then when Sam was there, he had to uh, kind of unlock the whole door. And Right, right. 
Yeah, and then he said he also said that if it wasn't for his relationship with Michael Anthony, he's not sure he'd be doing music right now. He says that his relationship with Mike is really what drives him and that he enjoys their camaraderie so much and he calls him his partner in crime and he says the only 